uh, some other things I wanted to just touch up on, and this is this is more towards uh, drug reaction. It is more neurology related, but it's more drug reaction. And I just wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about this. Specifically, I want to talk about side effects of antipsychotics and dopamine blocking agents. And then in a few minutes, we'll talk about side effects from um, some of the antidepressants. Uh, selective ser So there are basically, there are three major categories of antidepressants right now. Mm -hmm. Um, there are the newer uh, kinds, the what we call the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or the SSRIs, um, and then there are the older, older kinds, um, the tricyclic or tricyclic antidepressants, so the TCAs, um, and the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, or the MAOIs. Uh, the TCAs and the MAOIs have a very complex side effects profile, and so we tend not to use them as much anymore. Um, the MAOIs particularly have a lot of interactions with other drugs and dietary interactions as well. Um, specifically, uh, foods high in tyrosine, I believe, um, which is a precursor to um, the uh, monoamine. It's one of the precursor, uh, it's a amino acid um, pre precursor to the monoamines. And the way that the MAOIs work is they block the enzyme monoamine oxidase. And monoamine oxidase is responsible for oxidizing monoamines. I think we talked about this already. Um, and it is one of, the, one of the major enzymes involved in terminating the action of monoamine neurotransmitters and, and um, hormones. And so when you block that, uh, the action of that enzyme, you increase levels of those hormones um, and neurotransmitters, and that seems to be associated with improving mood in people who are depressed, because we know that dopamine is an important neurotransmitter when it comes to mood. Um, the problem is it can also increase catecholamines and can make you prone to developing you know, hypertensive emergencies and things like that. So people that eat foods that are high in tyrosine, you know, like kidney, certain meats and cheeses and wines and things like that, can have a pretty bad reaction um, to the MAOI, right? So, you know, it's, it's a very concerning one there. And then the tricyclic antidepressants, as we know, are toxic in that they... <laughs> Not only do they increase levels of dopamine and nor norepinephrine, epinephrine, um, which is associated with improved mood, but they do what? Well, they are sodium channel blockers, right? They block sodium channels, so they are cardiotoxic and they are neurotoxic to some extent at higher doses. Um, they are also anticholinergic, which means they increase your heart rate, dilate your pupils, um, and they're alpha blockers all at the same time. So you have this weird presentation where you're tachycardic, you're dry, you have dilated pupils, but your alpha receptors are all blocked, so your ve vessels are dilated, so your blood pressure gets low. And then your sodium, your fast sodium channels are poisoned, so your QT interval gets prolonged, and you end up having seizures and so on and so forth. So really, really lots of side effects associated with those. And then the SSRIs tend to be much safer, but they have some side effects associated with them as well. Um, but what I want to do is I want to talk about antipsychotic medications first. So what are antipsychotics? Huh? Okay, that's an example of one. Um, and what, are they, what do we use them for? We use them to yeah, to treat psychosis. Yeah. So what's psychosis? Is that a psychopath? Is a psychopath? Psychosis is uh, an alternate reality, per se. It's something that's, that's viewing something that's not there. You're definitely on the right, yeah, you're definitely on the right track. So and it might be tactile issues. It might be hearing things. Okay, you're getting, yeah. I think, I think, you, have a, I think you have an intuition, certainly. Um, so psychosis is a loss of contact with the reality that most other people share. So it's a loss of contact with shared reality. And that, that might very well be in the form of hallucinations, okay, and, uh, where you see things that may not 
be appreciated by anybody else. You hear things that might not be appreciated by anybody else. Or you have weird compulsions, right? You have paranoia or you have these weird compulsions that nobody else is able to um, appreciate. Um, so quite generally, psychosis is a, a, a loss of contact or an inability to appreciate the shared reality that most everybody else lives, lives in or appreciates, if that makes sense. Okay, cool. So antipsychotics are medications that are designed to treat psychosis. And guess what? They're full of side effects and they have mechanisms of action or even chemical structures that um, pretty much mask, or not mask, but are very related to many of the drugs that we give as EMS providers. And I'll talk about some of that crossover because they're actually commonly administered medications. So you basically have two major kinds of side effects associated with your antipsychotics. And these side effects are related to how antipsychotics work. So remember when we talked about dopamine and how dopamine is plays a, a very important role in mood and mood regulation and dopamine pathways uh, tend to be very important when it comes to that and we know that low levels of dopamine are as, may be associated with things like depression and we know that dopamine is in a very important molecule in movement motor pathways as well and we know that in diseases like Parkinson's for example where you lose dopaminergic neurons in certain areas of your brain specifically okay specifically something known as the nigrostriatal pathways okay and this is basically a um, a pathway that uh, connect that where neurons project um, from the substantia nigra which is a little area uh, it's you have it on both both hemispheres but it's kind of down toward the amygdala, a little above the midbrain, so kind of in that lower area of the brain, but it's, it's above, above the midbrain, the brainstem, so it's somewhere around the amygdala. And then those neurons project, okay, into an area around the thalamus, more or less, known as the striatum. And this tends to be a very important pathway for motor information traveling down the brain, you know, from uh, so efferent um, information coming out. And it's a disruption of those neurons that we see in Parkinson's disease. And then we also see a loss of neurons in the cerebellum as well, right? So the substantia nigra, um, the neurons that connect that to the striatum, we call those that the nigrostriatal pathway. Does that kind of make sense? Um, okay, so one of the hypotheses is that increased levels of dopamine or overactive dopamine pathways in the brain leads to psychosis. And in fact, um, amphetamines and methamphetamines are one of the classic ex examples that point to this hypothesis. And remember what they do. What do they do? Well, they turn those dopamine and norepinephrine transporters kind of inside out and flood the synapse with dopamine, norepinephrine. And um, people that take amphetamines often can develop psychosis, right? And in fact, amphetamines are sometimes known as psychosomimetic. They mimic psychosis. Um, and so it is this hypothesis where these drugs have kind of came from. And what these drugs do is they block dopamine receptors, okay? So they don't block the release of dopamine, but rather they block the receptors that dopamine attaches to. Um, there are two flavors, well, two general flavors, the D1 and the D2 receptors, the dopamine 1 and the dopamine 2 receptors. And so I believe that this is this is postsynaptic. So they block the receptors on the dendrites of neurons, right? You guys okay with that? 
And lo and behold, when we give people that have psychotic illnesses, schizophrenia, for example, when we give them dopamine blocking agents, some of the symptoms of their psychoses improve. Okay, so there is some efficacy to this dopamine hypothesis. Unfortunately, what did I just get done saying about dopamine's role in movement and motor pathways? It's kind of important, right? So if I give you a drug that blocks dopamine, if that drug is not very selective in where it blocks dopamine, which we don't have really selective, guess what? Can it also block receptors for dopamine in your movement pathways, specifically the nigrostriatal pathway? Yes. And that seems to be where a lot of the side effects of antipsychotics are originated in blocking dopamine receptors in areas of the brain where movement is important. Okay? And you have two general flavors of side effects. You have your acute side effects, and you have something called tardive dyskinesia. And all tardive dyskinesia really is, is a permanent form or a chronic form of the acute presentation. So if the acute presentation doesn't get better, that is more or less what we'd call tardive dyskinesia. Are you guys okay with that? So the, there are three general forms of acute side effects to antipsychotics. You have your akesthesia, dystonia, and we talked about this a little bit with dystonic reactions, right? And then we have something called Parkinsonism, okay? It's a Parkinson's-like presentation. Akesthesia is an inability to sit still. These patients are very fidgety, they move around, and they cannot sit still. Here's the thing that we need to understand about akesthesia. This is not due to anxiety, okay? This is not because your patient's anxious. This is due to their motor pathways not being able to regulate movement normally, and they are physically, chemically, and structurally unable to control their movement. Okay, they're up, they're down, they're fidgety, they're moving around, and no amount of attempting to, quote-unquote, calm them down will help. Okay, because this is not an anxiety issue. This may cause anxiety, but ang this anxiety does not cause this. Are you guys okay with that? This is not somebody having an anxiety attack. This is not somebody anxious or concerned or worried. This is somebody that has a real problem with their, their movement pathways. So it's often confused with agitation. And how do we treat agitation in people that have a history of psychosis? Just guess. We give them more antipsychotics, right? Which does what to their problem? Makes it worse, right? So you see how this can become a vicious cycle if we're not good investigators. Okay. The next one is dystonia or dystonian. We've talked about this. This is a dystonic, the, this classic dystonic reaction. And this results in intermediate and sustained contractions of multiple muscle groups. Okay. And these often happen at the same time. And generally with muscle groups, you have your agonist muscle, right? That's the prime mover of a certain motion. And then you have an antagonist muscle, muscle which antagonizes a certain motion. For example, if I want to flex my arm, what is the agonist in flexing my arm? The bicep. The bicep, right? The bicep brachii. What would be the antagonist? The tricep. The tricep, right? And then likewise, in extending the arm, the tricep would be the agonist, and, and the antagonist to extending the arm would be the bicep, right? What happens if both the tricep and the bicep contracts at the same time? You have weird contortion that occurs, right? And so these people can become very contorted, and, they can, and it can be very painful, okay? And they can have several different things. They can have something called an oculogyric crisis, okay? Where, as you might guess, this is what? These are the, the different rectus muscles around the eye contracting at the same time, okay? Um, you can have uh, retro and torticollis. 
uh, or torticollis, and this is contraction of your neck muscles. Okay, you can have macroglossia. This involves the tongue, right? The tongue protrudes out, or gets stuck out, or or kind of gets locked in a weird position, um, and that of course can lead to tongue protrusion. You can get pharyngeal dystonia. Okay, that can involve your vocal cords even. You have speech problems. You can have laryngeal spasms in some cases, um, which, of course, would be the result of laryngeal dystonia. You guys okay with that? All right, cool. Um, all right. And then, finally, uh, Parkinsonism is a Parkinson's-like presentation, right? Well, these people present like they have Parkinson's disease. They get the bradykinesia. That's the slow movement. The mask-like face. Have you ever seen somebody with, with, with severe Parkinson's? And what happened? And sometimes their face can just, right? They get what we call a flat affect. Most of us are able to, um, we have what's called an affect, or we have um, a way of conveying our mood or our general emotional state. And you will see people on antipsychotics that will just kind of have a flat effect. They don't really show emotion and they can get real monotone. Um, for example, Dr. Divin. I don't know if you guys have noticed how he communicates or how he looks um, because he takes um, medications to control. Um, he has a very severe bipolar disorder. Um, he'll actually probably talk to you guys about that as well because he knows it you know really well and he is on um, antipsychotic mood stabilizing medications and that is part of why he kind of talks and communicates and looks the way he does um, due to being on those medications um, ataxia that drunk shuffling gait and pill rolling have you guys ever seen pill rolling yeah right pill rolling right you seen that yeah that's kind of the, I think of pill rolling as a low dopamine problem. And then I, there's another term called punding. Have you ever heard of that? Punding? Punding behavior? It's the opposite. It's a high dopamine problem. And then we see it in, in particularly in people that use uh, methamphetamines. And this is a repetitive activity that they do over and over again. Like um, maybe they take apart their radio. They take it apart, put it together. Take it apart, put it together. And they do some repetitive activity over and over. That's called punding, right? So you got punding and you got pill rolling, which is the opposite of that. And then, like I said, tardive dyskinesia is just the chronic manifestation of um, akesthesia, dystonia, and Parkinsonism. And if somebody develops tardive dyskinesia, guess what? <coughs> they have it forever. Even if you stop the antipsychotic they will suffer from this for the rest of their life, for the most part. So it can be very chronic and be, be, be very uh, debilitating. You guys okay there? So far so good? Okay, we'll ride along. All right, so let's talk about these antipsychotics real quick. Okay, we have three different flavors of these antipsychotics. Okay. I'm gonna start with the oldest, or the, 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 the oldest type. Okay, these, the oldest type of antipsychotics are sometimes known as neuroleptics. Okay, so if you hear something referred to as a neuroleptic, a first generation antipsychotic, or a typical antipsychotic. So neuroleptic, first generation, or typical. These are all referring to the same category. Okay? You guys cool with that? And these are drugs that produce quote unquote neurolepsis. This was a term that kind of came out of in, in the in the fifties and sixties. And these were the first agents that were developed that did provide some relief of psychosis. Okay? And so what we see with neurolepsis is we actually see three general things occur. We see a decrease in emotions, a decrease in affect, and a decrease in psychomotor activity. Okay? And you might think, well, that doesn't sound very nice, does it? 
But if you have somebody who is very psychotic and they have uh, serious emotional issues, serious affect issues, and you know they have serious psychomotor issues, whether you know they're striking out or their behavior is potentially dangerous, blocking some of that may be a better way of going about it. Right? It, it, it least may be safer. Now it doesn't. De now it doesn't necessarily treat um, the uh, the issue. You know, um, to everybody's liking. You know. For example, if you're the one who is suffering from psychosis, that doesn't necessarily sound like the best deal in the world, does it? And so when we talk about psychosis, are you guys familiar with positive and negative symptoms? You ever heard of that term? So positive symptoms are the more active things that we see. So the hallucinations, the behavior, the, the, the aggressiveness, the yelling, the crying. Um, that kind of stuff, those are all positive. And then you have what are called negative symptoms. And these are more like a withdrawal, withdrawing from society, not having friends, not being able to be around people, depression, um, loneliness, seclusion, those are all negative symptoms. Well, guess what? Antipsychotics are very good at treating the positive symptoms, but not the negative symptoms. Okay. So even somebody who's treated, um, you know, that has psychosis, if they're treated, they may very well suffer from all the negative symptoms. They may very well still have the depression, the, the inability to kind of to, to maintain friendships and be a part of society and all that, even though their positive symptoms may be under control. Okay? The thing to know about the neuroleptics the typicals or the first generation is these are very strong dopamine 2 blockers. Okay? And then we have some newer agents that were developed, and these are known as the atypical antipsychotics. And what they did with these is these are modified, and these block, okay, both serotonin and D2 receptors. And the affinity by which they attach to they they, they they antagonize the receptors changes from drug to drug, but it is not entirely dopamine two receptors. It also involves serotonin receptors, specifically the serotonin receptor that seems to be most associated with psychosis is the 5-HT, the 5-hydroxytryptamine, this is another name for serotonin, right? The 5-HT2A receptor. Blocking that receptor seems most, it seems more strongly associated with antipsychotic action. Um, and interestingly enough, people that take hallucinogenic drugs, many hallucinogenic drugs seem to have strong activity, strong agonizing effects at 5-HT2A receptors. Um, so the serotonin hypothesis of psychosis is um, a hypothesis that not necessarily competes with the dopamine hypothesis, but is uh, kind of alongside or is in conjunction with the dopamine hypothesis. You guys okay with that? Okay. Um, so yeah. So uh, specifically agents, uh, your classic hallucinogenics, um, psilocybin, that's the, we find in magic mushrooms, quote unquote, um, psilocybin, dimethyltryptamine or DMT, um, bufotanine, uh, mescaline to some extent, LSD uh, to some extent as well, all have very strong action at the 5-HT2A receptor. Okay, you guys okay with that? So these are dopamine and serotonin blockers, and guess what? The side effects profile tends to be lower with these, and these agents may actually be able to treat some of the negative symptoms of psychosis. So these may be a, a more a better rounded way of treating psychosis, and that they treat both the negative and the positive symptoms to varying degrees in, in certain patients. And then we have the uh, new agents, and these are what we call partial dopamine agonists. So these 
are thought to maybe even have a safer profile because they are only partial uh, antagonists. And there is only one that I'm aware of on the market currently, and that is aripiprazole. Um, so these are pretty new, and I'm only aware of one on the market. So when we're going through somebody's med list, okay, and you're looking at meds, okay, let's talk about some examples of your typicals uh, and uh, of your atypicals, okay. So your typical or your first generation chlorpromazine was one of the very first developed. This is something known as thorazine. This is the proteotypical antipsychotic. And this was developed and was kind of heralded, heralded in a mod, the modern age of psychiatry. Because prior to this, how did we treat people with psychosis? We locked them away, electroshock therapy. Um, occasionally, we would pound an ice pick into certain parts of the frontal lobes and lobotomize them, um, right? Pretty barbaric kind of stuff. Prior to that, we'd, we'd, we'd trepan people, right? We'd drill holes in their head and do all kinds of things. And so once Thorazine came, I believe it was in the late 40s, actually maybe even been the 50s, um, so it's a fairly contemporary um, invention, um, we finally had a way of treating psychosis, at least the negative symptoms, okay? And Thorazine or Clopromazine is, belongs to a class of agents known as the phenothiazines. And guess what? Does clopromazine sound similar to something? Oh, it sounds really similar to a drug we all know and love called promethazine. And guess what? Promethazine is a cousin to clopromazine. It is also a phenothiazine. So guess what? Promethazine or phenergen has the same side effects profile as typical antipsychotics. And giving this to a patient can precipitate, right, a dystonic reaction, can precipitate Parkinsonism, can precipitate um, akesthesia, and can potentially pre precipitate tardive dyskinesia as well. Right. You guys okay with that? Yeah, so very large side effects profile in promethazine. Um, some other common examples, haloperidol or haldol is an, an atypical, or atypical rather, excuse me. Um, loxapine or loxetine, okay. Um, Proloxin, telephron um, are some other ones, but certainly uh, thorazine and haldol are kind of your two classic agents that belong in this this class or typicals still very commonly used haldol haloperidol exceptionally common okay so your atypicals okay so these are dopamine and serotonin okay um, clozapine or clozaril is one respiridone or respiridol very common olanzapine or zyprexia another pretty common one um, quidipine or seroquel and this one is kind of the flavor of the month right now, ziprazidone or geodone. You see this very commonly used. Okay, so again, agents, these are atypical agents, these are typical agents, and your side effects profile tends to be higher in your typical agents. Some other agents that have activity that may be associated with these side effects are agents that we occasionally give. Um, ondansetron, what's that? Zofran. Zofran, boy, we give a lot of that, right? How does Zofran work? Well, it's a very strong 5-HT3 antagonist. Okay, so not 2A, but HT3, um, which is uh, serotonin-3 receptors, and these are found primarily in the chemoreceptive trigger zone of your brain and what goes on in the chemoreceptive trigger zone what centers do we have located there we have our vomiting centers right and that's how um, ondansetron seems to work 
blocks receptors in those centers and decreases vomiting. And of course, those specific centers are chemoreceptive, so they monitor chemical changes. And so these centers tend to be more sensitive to the presence of drugs. And that's actually what Zofran was developed for, was a chemotherapy drug. It was developed and still is used to pre-medicate people prior to getting chemotherapy to prevent nausea. So it is most effective for drug-associated nausea and may not work for other types of nausea as well. Okay? Um, are you guys familiar with a medication called metoclopramide? Very much so. Or Reglan, yes. Very common. I decided to put that in my life on that for nine months. Yeah. Uh, Reglan is another one that its primary mechanism of action is more, it has, it's a GI drug, and it may help decrease nausea, but guess what? It does have some serotonin and even some dopamine blocking actions, and so much more rare in these two here, but we do see some side effects occur with these medications, particularly when given intravenously. Okay? You guys okay with that? All right. Good deal. Some other problems that we can run into. There is a problem called neuroleptic malignant syndrome or NMS. Okay. And this is a syndrome that um, for, for mechanisms that are, that are pretty complex and not well understood, um, these patients will have the dystonia, okay, so they'll have these muscle contraction, and they will develop what's known as a lead pipe rigidity. And they'll kind of look like they have tetanus, and you guys have seen pictures of tetanus or drawings where people are like contracted on the bed. Um, and these people may look like that. They'll get contracted, and they'll be just kind of, they'll be laying down, and they'll be like a, a, a lead pipe, right, um, like a metal pipe just all contracted up, won't be able to move, and they'll just, like, um, what's that stupid thing where you see pictures of people, like, planking? Is that what they call it? Yeah. Right? Where they, right? And, and that's kind of what these people look like. And because of all of this, this um, excessive motor activity, they make lots of heat, and they can develop a potentially life-threatening hyperthermia. So it is the hyperthermia and this, this rigidity that... Um, makes up what's known as neuroleptic malignant syndrome, or NMS, okay? Now, there is another syndrome that is similar to N NMS associated with the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the SSRIs. Remember, these are drugs that inhibit the, the neuro, neuronal or neuroglial reuptake of serotonin, so serotonin stays out into the synaptic cleft longer. And these include paroxetine or Paxil, citalopram or Celexa, bupropion or Welbutrin, fluoxetine or Prozac, and this was actually the first agent that was developed, um, fluoxetine or Prozac. Um, and this came about in, believe it or not, in the 80s. So SSRIs have only been around since about the 80s, in the mid to late 80s even. And there's an interesting movie um, that came out. Um, it was in the 90s that kind of dealt with this whole uh, rise of um, SSRIs, and it was called Brain Candy. I don't know if you guys ever seen that or not. It's by the. It's a, by a group uh, called Kids in the Hall, and they're kind of a post um, Monty Python. You guys familiar with Monty Python? Very much so. Very much so, yeah. They're a post-Monty Python, but they, they kind of did the same thing. They're a group of people, and they um, it's a, they made this movie, and it, is, it was kind of an, it's an interesting take, and obviously it's a commentary on antidepressants, but it was a, a drug that was developed that made everybody happy. It just made you happy regardless of whatever your problem was, and, and it, it was all these different people with all these, these different problems. Um... But it was very much kind of Monty Python-like. I don't know if you're familiar with Monty Python, but like they, they had a lot of the Monty Python tropes. So like the women are all men dressed up as women. That's, you know, real Monty Python kind of thing. Same in this movie. But anyway, but there was this side effect that only affected a few people, but it was this really bad side effect 
Um, and anyway, it's an interesting commentary on, on these. Um, but that's kind of unrelated to this. Uh, Sertiroline or Zoloft, um, Escitalopram or Lexapro, and Fluvoxamine or Luvox. So if you see these, any of these on somebody's med list, this is an S these are SSRIs. Um, people that take SSRIs are potentially more prone to developing something called serotonin syndrome. And this is like neuroleptic malignant syndrome in that they get an elevated temperature, but they get this hyper excitation that develops. So their, their, their uh, blood pressure, their pulse increases, they can get a little bit irritable. Okay. And so it's like NMS without the lead pipe rigidity. Okay. Um, and this is very common in patients that are on antidepressants, or it's more common, I should say, or more problematic in patients that take antidepressants and hallucinogenics. Um, and you guys are probably familiar with the kind of the contemporary rise of um, so-called psychedelics. Um, lots of people are um, going, uh, there's actually a lot of tourism now, um, and in full disclosure, I have to admit, I have taken advantage of that, for better or for worse, and I have done my share of psychedelic tourism. Um, that is, traveling to areas of the world where these agents are legal um, to use and protected in some cases, generally through religious, um, through religious freedom things. And so I've um, actually had a little bit of experience with some of these. But that, that's totally aside from the point that because a lot of these psychedelic or hallucinogenic agents have strong action that revolves around this serotonin agonism. If you're taking a substance that causes lots of uh, serotonergic activity and an antidepressant, what might be the side effect of that? Yeah, serotonin syndrome. Right now, legit places—places places that you know are concerned about health. Uh, what are some of the things they tell people? Right, you you got to be off of all this stuff, these drugs, these foods, and and, and things like that. Um, but as you guys well know, you know, particularly younger people—not always, but you know, younger people who are perhaps perhaps a bit more impulsive um, may not heed those warnings. Right. Persuasion. Uh, possibly male, maybe more, more men, men you know. Or. Just to let you know, we've seen an uptick in LSD transport in this area. Oh, really? Over yeah. There, so. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, LSD. And look, what is the most common prescribed drug in the United States right now? Just guess what class of drugs it is, if you have SSRIs. SSRIs. <laughs> yep. Like the top five, I believe, or something like that, are the SSRIs, and then cardiovascular and diabetic meds under that. Yeah. So guess what? A lot of people are taking SSRIs and a lot of people are, you know, are, you know, um, maybe being stupid or, you know, like me and, you know, and some people, you know, some people buy fancy cars when they go into midlife. And like you did it somewhat correctly to the legal well, all yeah, you know, I and I don't really want to talk about what I, you know is it right or wrong what I've done. Well, you know, that's I don't I won't really want to get into that, but there are a lot of people that are definitely doing things that are increase their risk and and just doing these drugs in general, of course, going to increase your risk. Real quick, Chris. Yeah, what you got? Talking about like LSD and like antipsychotics. Uh huh. Stuff. Yeah. For CSA, you guys, one of the main ways we've been seeing these. Uh, LSD reuptake is actually through stamps. That's a classic way yeah, of doing it. Yeah. Stickers, stamps. Yep. So even something as innocuous as like a sucker or a sticker or a stamp in a vehicle or in the house or something, please don't touch it. And then yeah, we've that's... seen a huge intake of fentanyl issues. Uh, and, and actually packaged the same. And in fact, I would almost, I would almost argue that fentanyl and fentanyl derivatives, super fentanyls, May even be more deadly <laughs> than yeah. um, just grams, kilos yeah. of, of fentanyl derivatives of fentanyl coming through our checkpoint and being stopped. And, and if you touch that inevitably, yeah, yeah, for sure. 
And yeah, stamps, that's a real classic way of packaging LSD. And a lot of like manufacturers have their own it's little. Like, no, like, like, like postage stamps. Yeah, like postage, like a, oh. po yeah, yeah. And we'll get them in sheets. We'll pull them out of vehicles yeah. in sheets. Yeah. It depends on the manufacturer. Every, yeah, every manufacturer kind of has their, a lot of them have their own little trademarks, like a little heart or, you know, um, yeah, you, so. You guys ever watch Super Troopers? No. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh. That sucks. Well, <laughs> yeah, that sucks. <laughs> really? No one here's watches Jeremy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. How long have we been waiting for that? <laughs> well, did you hear about the uh, Kickstarter? Uh, yeah, I heard that they're really trying to push what You guys have never seen Super Troopers I and you're in I EMS? Oh, for sh what is that? The, the yeah, sh yeah. Game of Thrones. Shame. Shame. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. So the idea is, yeah. like Chris said, each manufacturer has their trademark, has their little sign. It yeah. doesn't matter if it's X or uh, LSD or PCP or whatever. Uh, heroin. Whoever's selling it, packaging it, marketing it, smuggling it, they all have their little signals. Yeah. So just don't. Just wear your gloves. Don't yeah, don't touch stuff you don't have to. I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, huh? Yeah, yeah. Stamps. Oh, don't do that. Yeah. All right. Um, so so there we are. I just wanted to touch, even though that's not GI specific. I think it was still a good conversation to have. Um, to make sure that we have our neurological bases covered.